Hey, we're sure glad that you're here today. Thanks for being a part of our service. Uh, Sharon and I have had the opportunity to uh, raise four kids. And um, as we have been raising kids, there was a time that as they would do something and we would begin to be involved in discussion, I would look at them inevitably and would say something like, you know, let me give you a great leadership principle. And so I kept doing that over and over and finally got to the point that I would start to do that and I would get sort of the, just the rolling of the eyes like, oh God, here he goes again. I mean, oh, can you just please stop? And let me just tell you, okay, now that all of them are gone, and let me just tell you that um, I don't know who's telling you that the empty nest is a bad thing, but they are lying to you, let me tell you, all right? Um, there is no kids at our house, and I mean, Sharon and I are having a great time. I'll just go, go ahead and tell you that, all right? I mean, last night, our daughter, Sarah Grace, came home, and she's done with volleyball, so she's home for Thanksgiving, and all of a sudden, I'm, 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 in, I'm in the hot tub with her, and I'm looking at her going, what am I doing out here with you? It's 11 o'clock, and I'm sitting here talking to you. And she just giggled like, oh, gosh, I did, I did this to you again, you know? And so I want you to know that, you know, we've always talked about leadership in our house, and I want to say to so many of you here this day is that there's a lot of you who have been with us for a long time now. And every Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we have done I Love This Place offering. And I want to thank you, and you don't even know this, or you really don't even know this, but because you have been willing to give, you have displayed just incredible leadership among the people of God, and even among people that you don't even know, because you have believed in the vision, and you have believed in, in, in the vision of what we are as a church, that we understand that we give, and it's not really about us, it's about giving to something even beyond us. And, and so uh, today we continue to look at this thing called leadership. And, we're in, and if you brought a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. That's sort of, it's in the Old Testament, and sort of the first part of the Old Testament. You can, you can get there if you brought a copy of God's Word. We'll stand a minute to read that scripture. But we're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. But let me sort of set the scene for you. David is now the king of Israel. And David is leading his army, the army of Israel. He is leading them against the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, they are giants of people. They are, this, this guy by the name of Goliath, maybe you've heard of, that David killed, is that, is that uh, David, uh, this, these Philistines, they were all really large people. And because they were large people, people were scared of them. Well, David and the Israelite army, they are in battle with them. And at this point is that the Scripture says uh, they are in a stronghold. In other words, I mean, the, the, it is getting hard. I mean, the battle is intensifying. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, David has these, well, David has, first of all, David has these 30 guys that are his generals, and David just sort of makes a comment. And, and he just makes a comment and just said, you know, I, 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 wish that I, had, I wish I had a drink of water. But not just any kind of water. I wish that I had some water from Bethlehem. Now, there's a real, really, that's really important. As a matter of fact, if you'll come back next week when we start our series, our, our Christmas series, okay, uh, uh, one more thing, uh, we'll tell you why that city is so important. But he's there and he said, I just wish I had some water from Bethlehem. And so there's these three guys, and they sort of, they show up, and three of his generals, and they go behind enemy lines, and they go get their commander-in-chief. They get David a, a cup of water. And so these three guys, these are the principles of leadership we've been talking about. And we've been talking about, we've already covered five leadership principles, and today is the sixth and seventh leadership. So we're going to be in First Chronicles chapter 11. Let me invite you, if you would, to stand with me as we read in reverence to the Word of God. It says, three of the 30 chiefs came down to David to the rock at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this. He said, should I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? Because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits 
of the three mighty warriors. Pray with me. God, I want to thank you for today. And I thank you, God, for people that already signed up to go through the waters of baptism. I thank you for the offering that we'll take at the end of the service. And God, I thank you for people that are here. I thank you for people who are displaying leadership in their life and sometimes don't even know it. And God, I pray that today, God, that I know that people that are here, a lot of times we don't really think about leadership principles because of just the storm that we are going through. God, I pray that through all of it that we would see how important it is even to continue to lead through the storms that we have. And I pray, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says amen. God bless you. Have a seat. Thanks for standing. And so here's the sixth principle of leadership that we need to apply, that we do the impossible. You see, David is longing for this drink from Bethlehem. And, and what happened was is that it was never brought up for a vote. Matter of fact, if it would have been brought up for a vote, there's nobody who would have voted to go behind enemy lines and to get this water. Because you see, number one, there was a principle that had already been displayed with these three, and that was they just showed up. We talked about that the very first week of this series. And see, that's a real important principle in leadership because when you're talking about showing up, it is true in so many areas. But these guys showed up. They really never took, they never took a vote for it because this is what everybody knew, that if you're going to go behind the enemy lines, you need to understand there's a great chance that you ain't coming back. As a matter of fact, David probably would have told him, you three boys that are thinking that you're going to go behind enemy lines and get the cup of water, if you do that, you need to go ahead and send somebody to see your spouse because you're probably not going to go home. You're probably going to die. And so what happens is that these guys went and got the cup of water and they brought it back to David. They did the impossible. You know, I think there's a lot of reasons that we look in our own life that we think that well, God's really not ever going to do the impossible with me. I think maybe there's, you know, there's that reason of, of thinking that we're really just, we're just really too ordinary. I mean, I'm not the kind of person that, that everybody looks at as a leader, and yet we really don't know that. We just think that we're really too ordinary. And yet, when you look at it, is that that first principle I want to go back to that we talked about, we talked about just showing up. The reason these three end up going to get water was they showed up. And you see, that's true in every area of your life. It doesn't matter if you are a middle school student in here today or if you're a senior adult and you're already retired. Every leadership principle that we talked about, including today, is that you have to understand they apply to everybody. They just don't apply just for one person. They apply to everybody. And so when you look at this is that they did the impossible. And see, what happens was is that these guys did the impossible because they just showed up. And that's true in all of our lives, that you are showing up consistently at work, that you're showing up in your family's life, that you're showing up for your spouse, that you're showing up at church, that you're showing up in your own devotional life, that you're showing up with your finances, that, and, you're, and you're honoring God with your finances, that you're showing up, and maybe even today, you've got some issue where there's an addiction in your past or addiction right now in your life, that you are showing up, that you want to get better. And you see, those are kind of the kind of people that God uses all the time, the people that just are simple, ordinary kind of people. And yet, we think that because we're ordinary that God's not using us. I think a lot of times is that we look at our past and we go, man, I've made so many mistakes in the past. I've burned so many bridges. I'm a failure. If you knew what my mistakes were even this past week, there's no way that God could use me. I mean, I've, I have failed so miserably. Or maybe it is that with your life is that if you got honest about it, it's not just your failures. It's the fact that somebody has burned a family member in the past. I mean, how many times do we hear that story at church, right? that somebody burned a family member and you're, and you're just bitter at church. And so I'm thank you that you're here, that you're willing to allow God to do something maybe that you're not really sure what that is. And yet we look at that a lot of times we go, I just don't think that God's going to use me because I am so bitter toward the church because of what God did to somebody in the past. Or maybe it's just a relationship that you have been burned so badly and you've been burned so badly that we think, how in the world is God going to move me beyond that to, to make me a leader? I think at times is that we look at our life and we think that 
There's no way that, that God's going to use me because I, I, I've, I've never, ever seen the impossible be done. I think that's really what happens in church a lot. I think that we've never really seen the Spirit of God do anything great. And so we just sort of think, well, the impossible really can't be done. And we've never seen it. You see, when you look at the other 27 generals that did not go to get the glass of water, they didn't do anything wrong. But they didn't show up. But these other 27, what happened was is that they saw that the impossible could be done. Because for the first time, they saw the three do the impossible. And see, what happens is, is that what we forget about is that we forget about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We forget that when we come to the point that we say, you know what, I'm going to turn from my sins. I mean, I'm going to turn from my sins. I'm walking in life, and I'm going to turn from my sins, and I'm going to meet Jesus, and I'm going to give my life to him, and I'm going to become a follower of Christ. That's going to happen in my life. And because of that, the Holy Spirit of God is going to do incredible things in my life. Now, let me ask a question here, okay? How many of you were like me that you were raised in a Baptist church? Raise your hand. Okay, now keep them up. Don't put them down. Keep them up, all right? Act like you're proud here, okay? Keep them up, all right? Now, you don't, don't put them down. How many of you were raised in a Methodist? Raise your hand. No, no, Southern Baptist. See, that's what y'all all want to do is y'all want to quit raising your hands, all right? If you were raised in a Methodist church, raise your hand. Presbyterian, raise your hand. You see, let me tell you, let me tell you the common denominator with this third group of people, okay? Anytime. No, no, keep your hands up. Come on. Anytime that you ever mention the Holy Spirit in your church, oh, people got a little freaky, didn't they? I mean, they go, this guy's crazy. He's talking about the Holy Spirit because even back, back in the day, some of you remember, they didn't call the Holy Spirit the Spirit. They called him the Holy what? Ooh, dogs, you, you say that word? They're thinking that the dudes get fixing to get snakes out right now, okay? Now, put your hands down, okay? Now, let me ask a question, all right? If you were raised in, let me see if I can get these, Assembly of God, Church of God, Charismatic, raise your hand. Okay, these are the crazies right here, okay? I mean, they took Holy Ghost to a whole new level, right? But can I just tell you something? See, what happens is that we were raised in church is that we get so, we get so afraid of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is that we don't see the Holy Spirit do anything impossible. We don't believe it can be done because church has now regulated itself to be nothing more than a social club, to be more than a country club where we just come and meet people because it feels sort of good to, to be around people. And yet, no, the thing is that just because you're here today, you know what, the Spirit of God, He wants to do the impossible in your life. See, there's some of you here right here today, you are in some kind of addiction, you're, and you're thinking, you know what, I can't be helped. Because I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and yet the Holy Spirit is saying to you, I need for you to trust me and to get out of my way for a little while. That doesn't mean that there's not more counseling. That doesn't mean that you've got to continue to stay with it. But here's what we do is that we take the Holy Spirit out of everything that's happening. I had an old buddy of mine that used to say all the time, when something in church was fixing to go and you could sort of, you know, you could sort of see it happen, and he would go, mm -mm, man, the ghost is up in here today. I don't know how many times people have come to the bridge and they would just walk in and go, I'll just be honest, I, I, I didn't even believe in God. I still don't believe in God, but I, I just got to tell you what happened to me today. Okay, what happened? When that guy came out and did that worship, I, I don't even really believe in God, but he started singing. I got all these chills up and down me. <laughs> And I just look at him and go, you better buckle in real tight. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, you better buckle in. Why? Because the Spirit of God is at work. You see, we don't see that. We don't see that because church is nothing more, and yet God wants to do something so supernatural in our life. We forget that. And God is screaming at you today going, I want you to be a leader, but the first thing is you've got to invite Jesus into your life. Then after that is that you have to allow the Holy Spirit of God to be unleashed in your life. Is there just one person here talking? Listen today. She was raised charismatic. That's why she does that, all right? Thank you, John, and bless you. I'm sorry that the two people to your left, Greg and Susan McRae, couldn't clap with you. And he was even raised charismatic, all right? He was word of faith. I mean, that's, that's to the extreme, you know? 
And so the thing is that the Spirit of God wants to do something. Yet we just sort of sit back and we don't see it. And let me tell you, you know me. I'm all about teaching truth and biblical truth. But don't miss this. is that we have to connect the biblical truth to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit because the truth is penetrating your heart. See, we don't want to do that, though. You know why? We might, we might not be in control anymore. That's the best thing that could ever happen to you, ever, is where the ghost shows up in your life. So you see, these, these guys did the impossible. Let me just say, listen, don't miss this. God is not interested in doing normal in your life. You can do normal all by yourself. God wants to just unleash the Spirit of God in your life. And we forget that. Oh, especially for us men. Can, men, can I get an amen? Come on now. Oh, no, no, that, no that, that would just, your wives, amen, and for you. Men, can I just get an amen right there? Let's try again here. Men, can I get an amen on that? Amen. That sounded good, didn't it? Just an amen, all right? Because, see, us men, we want to be in charge. That's the way God's made you is to be a provider. And then when we think that we're a provider is that we're supposed to provide for the Spirit. You can't provide anything for the Spirit. He provides everything for you. He doesn't want you to be normal. He wants you to be abnormal. So do the impossible. Here's the seventh principle of leadership. We pour out the offering. Go back to First Chronicles chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this. He said, should I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? Because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. David poured out the offering in respect of the soldiers that were given their life. You see, because David recognized that the devotion wasn't to him. The devotion was to God. David knew who the credit had belonged to. Because, see, the offering, when he poured it on the rock, now just wait a minute. I mean, just think about it. Okay, you're a man or you're a woman, you're in the army, and you're one of the 30 generals. And all of a sudden, this guy, these three guys decide we're going to go behind enemy lines, risk our lives, and we're going to bring our commander-in-chief a glass of water. So you come, and you bring it, and you give it to the commander-in-chief, and right in front of you, he takes the water, and he does this. How hacked off are you? Are you kidding me? What are you doing? We risk our lives. David says, no, no. That offering is unto the Lord. That's not to me. Because, see, all these army, all, the, all these ar people in the Israelite army, they're risking their lives. So this is an offering poured out to God. He was pouring it out, demonstrating that only God is worthy of such devotion. Let me sort of show you how it plays out in our life. <laughs> I do a job, and somebody pays me an extra $100. So I got an extra $100. So what I do is, is that if I really believe that I'm supposed to take the Scripture, what Scripture teaches, and that is that back even before the law, pre-law. So that means it runs through, it, it runs through, through eternity. Pre-law, he talks about taking a tenth of your income and giving it to the Lord. And they would give it to the temple. So now we don't have a temple, we have a church. And so God says, I want you to take a tenth of your income and I want you to give it to me. And so what do we do is that we take a tenth of it. I got $100, so I take $10 and I just take it and I, and, and I take my hands off of it and I give that to God through the local church. That's God's, I don't touch it. That's his, I, that's yours, all right? So there you are, that's God's, okay? And so what we do is that we, we take this and we just go, you know what? You really don't expect me, do you, to, that I get $100, and, and you don't really expect me, do you, to go ahead and take that money and, and tie that I'm in because I really need all that money. And you got this, you know, it's a supernatural thing, the work of the Holy Spirit. I know you don't think that the Holy Spirit does supernatural things with your money, but he does. 
And so what happens is, you know, God says, I need you to trust me. I need you to take, I need you to take 10% of it, and I need you to give it. And see, this is where we mess up. Even with some of you people who are tithers, is that we get to the point that we get a bonus at the end of the year, or, we, or, some, or somebody gives us money. What we do is that we go, well, obviously God knew that I was going to get that, and you know what, i got to pay my taxes and all that. So therefore, I'm, not, I, I'm, just, I'm just supposed to, I'm, that's not supposed to be given to the Lord. I'm supposed to be able to keep that. And so what we do is that we keep, we keep all of our money and we don't give anything to what God is, that is God's. And so the supernatural experience is, is that you offer an offering, you give an offering to the Lord. It starts with your 10%. And I know it's really easy to look at it and go, well, yeah, but I make a lot more money than somebody else. And my 10% would be a lot more. That's right, because if God can trust you with little, he'll trust you with much. And he trusts you with much, he expects you to tie that. And so to take it and to take that 10 and give it. And see, this is what we do. Well, I'll pay all my bills, and then I'll give it. No, 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 no. This is called first fruits. This is that you take and you give first to God. Why? Because God gave to us first. Amen? He gave to us. He sent his son to die on the cross that we get to miss hell for all of eternity. Understand that? And so what we do is that God says, I want you to take a tenth of it, and I want you to give it. Now, you see, what happens is, is that we, we do that. Now, see, that's the reason, this whole concept right here is the reason our youngest, Sarah Grace, says, don't give me money for, don't give me money for Christmas. Just give me gift cards. I don't have to tithe gift cards, all right? You need to pray for her. She gets that disobedience from her mother, so you need to pray for them, okay? <clears throat> Sheriff's in Watertown. That's the reason I can say that today. She's not here, all right? I'm a man. I, I, I'm the leader of my house, but Sheriff's not here today, so that's why I can say that, all right? <clears throat> So see, what we do is that we, 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 don't, we don't give God's his. Now see, some of you, you, you really actually believe all the stuff about how God wants to work in your life. So now the grace gift offering comes and you go, what? I, God give me, God's blessed me and given me that. What I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to give 10%, I'm going to give my first 10 to the Lord's local church. And guess what? I love this place. Offering's coming, so I'm going to give another 10. I still got $80. And see, what I do is that, see, so I worked extra and I got this. So I've already, and I've already tied it. But see, this is what I'm going to do is that Cher's going to walk up to me. And Cher don't know that I've got $80 in my pocket. And she's going to walk up and she goes, hey, do you need money? Oh, yeah, I need some money. And so she gives me more money. Now, she don't know I have $80. See, I just don't think that's enough. So I'm taking her money as well. Amen? All right? I'm taking her money. And so I got more money. All right? Now, so I give that. And see, that's the reason that when we gave even our son who lives in Los Angeles, and I don't know if you know this or not, pretty expensive to live in Los Angeles, and we gave him money, and I, I texted him this week, and I said, you better make sure that you tie that money because you are, you are begging for God to give you work right now in, in the film industry. And so let me say, God's going to see if he can trust you, so make sure you give your first hand. Don't, you, you give that to the church that you're going to right now, bub. Yes, sir, I got you. And see, what we do is that we don't want to do that. We want, we, want to keep, we want to keep our money. And see, we think, no, if I'll just take it all, I'll just take all my, I'll take all my $100 and, and I'm, I'm going to tithe if I want to. But here's what we, here's what we always, we miss is that the 10%, that's, that's not the part's God's. All of it's God's. He just wants to see if you're going to give an offering. Gives you a chance, gives you an opportunity. So you have to ask yourself, am I going to give my offering just with my money? And see, a lot of people that, you know, they get on my case, I can't believe he preaches on money. I think the only reason I, 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 I really believe this, that if people would, if we had 100% of our people that tithe, which we don't, but if 100%, 100% of our people tithe, people go, would you, would you quit preaching on money? I wouldn't, I wouldn't quit preaching on money. Because it is a stewardship, it's a biblical stewardship to follow God. It is the most, it's, it, it's the most interesting, it's the most, one of the most important things to God is how we handle our own stewardship in our life and our finances. So let me ask you, what, what would you do with an offering? Would you give that to God or would you just say, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to keep it myself? No, your, your offering is that you give that to the Lord. You take your hands off of it and you give that to him. That's the reason a lot of you are not getting blessed with your money is because you won't trust God with it. Now, it might be right now you're going, oh, yeah, God is blessing me. You know how much money I got? Oh, yeah, but what, if, what, what, what would happen if God got involved in your money? Oh, man. See, that's where the Holy Spirit, that's where he began to do a work inwardly in, in your own life. And so our offering, but here's, here's what we miss, all right? We miss that the offering that we give, yes, sure, God blesses us because we're obedient. But this, don't miss this. This is what we miss, is that the offering that you give, it's, it's never for you. It's for always for somebody else. You see, the reason that, 
at 10 o'clock that they're doing, that Lance is preaching today at Watertown, and they're going to have baptisms. The reason that people are going to go through the waters of baptism, and there's going to be people that are giving their life to Christ, and they're going to make that decision today. The reason that's going to happen is because you gave. Because you gave last year and the year before that when we began to cast vision for Watertown. The reason that... Phil Johnsey, who was in here this morning, who's a missionary to Africa, that we support his ministry. We support that, and they're going to start 80, over 80 churches in Africa next year. You know how many hundreds and thousands of people will come to faith in Jesus in Africa because you gave? You see, you never thought about that your money was going. You think about Lance Brown sharing Christ with people at Vanderbilt University and sharing with athletes and that taking place. Why does it happen? Because you give. Why in the world can there be missions be be, uh, done in Honduras with Ignite Missions with Sam and Peggy Fazell? Because you gave. Why in the world do we go to youth camp and see hundreds of kids go and a lot of them give their life to Christ and go through a Toma weekend because you chose to give, that's why. You see, your offering is never for yourself. It's always for somebody else. You see, when we talk about giving an offering, it, it's, not just about, it's not just about giving an offering, but it's also giving yourself. And you see, when you give your... And so, see, this is what happens. It starts in this whole leadership principle that you choosing to give yourself away to Christ. And for some of you here, you've never made that decision. Oh, you know all the, all the right lingo and you know, the right, you, you know the correct things to say, but you've never come to the point that you really have surrendered your life to Christ. You've never done that. Oh, you love coming to church and you might love the bridge, but you really have never come to that point where you said, yes, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm surrendering my life to Christ. I want Jesus to do something with me greater than myself. And see, here's what you got to do. Just like your money affects other people, when you give your life to Christ, it affects other people. It doesn't, it doesn't just affect you. It's an offering that you give of yourself. You see, when you give your life to Christ, it affects your spouse. It ought to affect your kids. It ought to affect the coaches that your kids play under. It ought to affect the bug man who comes to your house to spray for bugs at your house. It ought to affect the people who do your lawn service. It ought to affect the people that that check you out at the grocery store because you've made that decision. It's not just about you. Oh yeah, sure, you get heaven. And yes, you miss hell. You get all that. That comes with a package. But see, when you give your life to Christ, it's all about affecting somebody else's life. You see, this is what's taking place today. Is that some of you today is that you are sitting right now sort of on the edge of your seat wondering, you know, I just came and I really never expected God to do something in my life. And God is stirring something in your heart. You really don't know what's going on. It's just the Spirit of God doing something. And see, the Spirit of God is trying to draw you to a relationship to himself. That's what's taking place in your life right now. And see, so you didn't get up this morning thinking that you were going to come to church and make some kind of life-altering decision because you decided to give your life to Christ. You see, you were just like those three men. I don't think those three men got up in the morning and go, you know what, I think my goal today is to get up and to go behind enemy lines, risk my life, and give a cup of water to my commander-in-chief. I don't think they did that. I think they got up and just showed up for work, and they, when they showed up, God began to do something supernatural because they were in the moment. Can I just, don't miss this, okay? You're in the moment right now. Right now, you are in the moment. And see, what happens is is that you're in the moment, and right now you're not really sure about what you ought to be doing because right now something is fixing to happen. Have you seen anybody sitting right here? Let me sit here next to you a minute. So what happens is is that, see, you you, you come to the point, and you're sitting here, and you're wondering, I I really ought to think I ought to make this decision and give my life to Christ. And I ought to to go through the waters of baptism, but I'm not really sure, and yet something is going on in your life, and you're not sure. And this is Abby and Dustin. Dustin, you got baptized when? Dustin's still thinking about it, and Abby's already pulled up the date. That's how this works, okay? September 20th? It was at the 10-year. Oh, the 10-year reunion. Okay, outside, okay, at Charlie Daniels Park. And so there was a time that Dustin chose to make that decision, and see what happens is, is that now that's affected Dustin and Abby. Now, here's what, here's what you don't know. You need to take these two to dinner and let them tell you their story, how Christ has affected their life because of the storms in their life. 
But see, what happens is that we get to the point right here and we go, oh my gosh, I'm just going to sit here. And you know what? I'm, I, I'm not sure I can make this decision because, oh man, as a man, I mean, I sort of got my stuff together. I don't, I don't need to be making this decision. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God sort of begins to prick your heart and you're going, oh wait, I wonder if I ought to make this decision. And so now what happens is, is that I give my life to Christ and I'm wondering if I ought to, okay, if I give my life to Christ, do I go through the waters of baptism as well? Sure you ought to. Why? Because it's the next step. You see, what happens in this whole leadership thing is that we get involved in, in what's, where we struggle is that in the space that we don't know what to do because we want to control our own destiny. And, and Jesus says, no, you give me life. I need you to obey me. I need you to take the next step. And so we're sitting here thinking, okay, do I need to take the next step? And so I'm sitting here as a man going, man, I really ought to make this decision, but I really, I didn't come thinking today. I'm sort of like the three guys that served David. I didn't get up thinking that I was going to make this decision, but God's doing something supernatural in your life, and the Spirit of God is convicting you. And so you're thinking, I really ought to do that. And so I get the opportunity to give my life to Christ and even go through the waters of baptism. And there's some of you here today, you've given your life to Christ, but you've never gone through baptism by immersion. That's the next step. It's an obedience that you make that decision, and you're going, okay, I need to make this. I need to make this. And so finally, there is just something on you that goes, oh my gosh, I, I got to go. I got to make this decision. I'm getting up and I'm going out. And as I'm going out, I'm going to decide that I'm going to give my life to Christ and I'm going to find somebody that can help me where I can give my life to Christ. And so when I go out here and I see all these people in the lobby, I need, anybody got donuts out here? I need some donuts. Anybody got donuts? Oh, thank you, Mr. Vitz. Have you been eating these donuts? Yeah, don't eat them all. Don't eat them all? Okay, I won't eat them. Can I share with them and people? Are you guys back here praying or just chit-chatting? Kurtz, don't be lying. Mike Kurtz, I know you're not, okay? So you get donuts here, see? And the thing about it is that you get free, you get free donuts coming to church, dude. Here, y'all, some donuts here. There you go. Free. Free as me. Donuts? You good? You good? You sure? I know you're good, but do you want some donuts? All right, all right. Yeah. Donuts? Oh, come on, bro. Come on now. See, didn't even ask that. Donuts? Come on. There you go, brother. You want one? You sure? You're a lot cuter than him. Anybody told you that? I promise you that, all right? All right. Anybody need donuts? All right. Oh, here you go, bro. Come on. Come on. There you go. All right. Thanks, Alabama win yesterday? Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Who'd they play? Nobody. You don't even know? Mercer. Mercer. That's nobody. Are oh, y'all some donuts? Here you go. Here you go. Go ahead. There you go. All right. Donuts? Donuts? Here. Oh, you can't have them. There you go. Here. Take his. There you go. All right. See, what happens is, man, you come to church and get free donuts. This past Wednesday night, I was here meeting some teenagers, and this young man walks up to me and he goes, Pastor Phil, I've got a question. What is it? I'm, I'm waiting for some de deep theological question. How do y'all sell those donuts for 50 cents? <laughs> well, the goal is not to make money. The goal is just to cover our cost. Dude, that's the best deal in Lebanon. Did you know that? I said, man, I'm glad you're enjoying me. He said, why do you not have donuts on Wednesday night? I said, because... We couldn't provide enough, that's why. But see, I got a better message for you today. Jesus doesn't offer donuts. He offers eternity to give your life to him. And there's some of you here today, you are so close. You need to take a step, but the problem is that you're going, it's uncertain. There's coming a point that you're gonna find out you can't trust yourself. So why would you not trust God? Give your life to him. Would you pray with me? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're watching online, I'm going to ask that you would do the same thing. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, have you really made that decision? If you took your last breath in that seat, do you know without a doubt that you're going to spend eternity in heaven. If you don't know that, you need to settle that issue today. And if you want to settle that issue, you can do that right now. You mean it's that easy? Yeah, God didn't make it complicated. It's about you just surrendering your life to Jesus. So right where you are right now, if you want to make that decision, I'm going to ask as I pray that you, as I pray out loud that you would repeat this prayer after me silently. And this is not a magical prayer. It's just a prayer that you're saying, yes, 
I give my life to you, Jesus. Now, this is what I'm going to ask everybody to do, okay? If you've never done that, I just want you to repeat it after me silently. So as I pray, you pray, would you? Dear God, on this day and in this place, I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And on this day, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart to take control of my life. And I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I'm willing to follow you from this moment on.